Good afternoon, everybody. Eddie Webb. We are here at the New Media Lab at Mesa Community College. And today, our guest for our podcast series is our director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, Dr. Jennifer Strickland. And uh, we're going to get into some stuff around gratitude. And uh, Dr. Strickland has had her life has been documented and celebrated she has an amazing story of resilience over uh, cancer we're going to talk a little bit about wellness today and gratitude and and all that kind of cool stuff dr strickland how you doing great dr webb thank you for having me yeah it's wonderful to be here it's always good to have you over in the lab. I know you've came over and sat with our students. And I've invited you over a few times. and You've watched videos with us and done some workshops, I think. Largely get a, a feel for the, for the lab and the energy that the students bring to the campus. So for our listeners, um, you're a spokesperson for an organization, I believe, back east, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, a spokesperson is, you know, I, I'm a patient advocate and I do some work with the Department of Defense is a big funder of cancer research and the foundation, it's the Fibrillomeller Cancer Foundation and they're located in Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut. And it focuses specifically on the type of cancer I had, fibrolamellar, which is a ultra rare, it's considered an ultra rare cancer, liver cancer. And so I do some some work on behalf of the foundation with the Department of Defense looking um, at cancer research. The Department of Defense is unique. They include patients, consumers, on all of their cancer research panels when funding, when looking at funding for cancer research. And so I, I get to act as a patient. It's really cool. But I mean, what makes your story unique, and I hope you'll share with us, is that the type of cancer, this rare cancer that you had, the survival rate is yeah. right, almost non-existent. Yeah, right? it's, I, was, I was living in Boston at the time. I had actually come out here for, and gotten my bachelor's degree at ASU, but then I moved back home and was living in the city with some friends of mine. And um, UMass Amherst, which is the equivalent of ASU out here, UMass Amherst had made the Final Four in 1995. It was a big deal. And so... A whole lot of us went out to a sports pub, one of Boston sports pubs, and, and I drank quite a bit, which I'm not a big drinker usually. And in the middle of the night, I just woke up in excruciating pain. Turns out when your liver is completely consumed with cancer, it's very hard to process alcohol. Mm. And so um, that was how it was discovered. I, we had, I had an exploratory surgery to see what it was, and... They closed me up and, and told me I had three to six months to live. And, and this uh, is in uh, 1995. 1995, okay. yeah. This, so this was before the internet. So yeah. I couldn't Google the dreadful statistics that were out there. My mom did a lot of research, but, but the doctors were, they're, they're really big on statistics. It's uh, fascinating. Healthcare scientists, even the work I've done over the years with, with the cancer panels, you know, everybody's really big on statistics, and I understand why. But when you're a patient, that's not where you find your hope, you know. And um, so I was, I was told I, was, I had three to six months. In fact, the surgeon said he was being very generous with three to six months because it was everywhere. And the cancer had, it grew like moss in my abdomen. So it was wrapped around my stomach and my lungs and my heart. And it had, uh, it had gone just all over the place. And at some point, I realized the doctor kind of had written me off already. Um, and it, I mean, it was a, quite a process, a journey to, to finding hope, because it's really hard to find hope when you're told there is none. And, um, and I realized, you know, if he's not going to believe in me, I need to find a doctor who does. And, and that made the difference, really. Um, I found a surgeon who was early in his career and he was doing live liver transplants. He was one of the early pioneers. There really was only three surgeons at the time in the country that were doing it, and one happened to be at the hospital I was at. And it was supposed to be a four-hour surgery. It was 11. There were some, some problems. But, um, you know, and he came out, and he thought, no, nah, I, don't, I don't know that I could have gotten it because you have to get every last cell. 
and it was everywhere. So he wasn't totally certain he could do that. So, so you had a liver transplant. A liver resection. Re- okay. Yeah. Your liver uh, regenerates. Oh, okay. So he took my liver out, cut out ninety percent of it, and put back a little tiny piece. Wow. And then uh, you know scraped off and extracted the cancer from all the other places. There were some major veins and arteries in and out of my liver that had been crushed by the cancer. So he attempted to reconstruct those and put that a little bit back. And so it, you kind of have a transplant, but with your own. It's, you yeah. know, a liver resection. And then, you know, your liver regenerates within four weeks. I don't have two lobes like everybody else, and it's really small, but it's very functional. So, um, wow. yeah. And it was, you know, it, the the procedure had some some complications not not that i cared i was alive right and i live with those complications still um 25 years later and i have to manage them every 3 months usually um so it's very present in my life always which you know i i think about your the gratitude video it really resonated with me because there isn't a day in 25 years that I haven't been grateful for my ability to walk, to get out in the morning and walk. I go out every morning for an hour and I walk. And I don't walk for speed. I don't walk for fitness. I take a cup of coffee and I stroll. And I look at the morning light coming through the leaves and I take deep breaths and I'm grateful that I'm healthy enough to walk. There are times that I'm not healthy enough to walk. And so, Every day is, you know, a really is a gift. I've recently discovered meditation walking, and it is a life changer for sure. I mean, uh, today at 2 o'clock, I'm going walking with uh, Professor Jaime Herrera along the canals. Do you still stay in touch with your doctor? I, I did. He retired about two years ago, but oh. he, I had to have a, surgery done uh, about four years ago, and he did it. Um, so I flew out there because he's really the only person I trust. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but he retired last year, and so I'm, oh. I'm very worried about that. But <laughs> but I'm happy for him, which is great. Yeah. You know, meditation is, is interesting. Meditation really helped me when I was diagnosed mm-hmm. because, you know, a terminal diagnosis is it's very heavy. It's weighty. It weighs on your soul like... No, but nothing. It's just, it's, yeah. it's always there and it's always present. And meditation is really was able to help center me and take me out of some really dark places. And, um, I, you know, I tried a lot of, as many cancer patients do, a lot of alternative therapies. But for me, I did, um, the hospital offered something called biofeedback. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they teach you to meditate for pain management. Oh, wow. And... So, um, and it was part of, I was on a clinical drug trial for a, a chemotherapy drug trial. You know, they, they hooked me up and they measure my brain wave and my heart rate and my sweat and my, um, like my eye activity. And it's amazing the things they measure. And then they teach you to meditate so that you can manage pain is the goal, but it also is wonderful for managing stress. Does it work? It yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it teaches you and trains you to meditate, which is very hard to do. I mean, right. you know, your mind just never stops. You know that we've, we've talked about how your mind just gets going and yeah. meditation. If you, if you, if you're really skilled at it and it takes a lot of practice, you can stop all of that and you really can get centered. Um, but it, it takes practice. It was a really valuable experience and helped me through all of that. Yeah. When I graduated uh, Chico State in California, there was three or four English professors all went went in and bought me a graduation present to stay uh, five days in a Buddhist monastery <laughs> <laughs> because I had I had given the commencement speech and as a undergraduate I, at that time I was reconciling a lot of my own stuff, working it out. You know, I was a reentry student. I was really involved in the American Indian activism and getting to know that whole movement at the time. But I was, I I didn't have any sort of sophistication about how to articulate uh, the oppression. And of course, genocide, environmental, I just, I just, I had no skill, right? 
but I had the passion and I was determined, you know, to be a voice for the elders who I knew at that time, you know, we're talking 87, 89, something in there. A lot of suffering in the, in the Indian community. This is way post casino type environment and all of that. The elders, you know, were born in the early 1900s, right? And so I'm not sure people actually knew what had happened, right? They were just sort of born into this position in the United States. And uh, I was doing my best, but I was, yeah, the anger would get the best of me, you know, because I also had played sports all my life and I was competitive and I wanted to win, but I didn't know what it was I wanted to win exactly, right? So this is a lifelong journey. But anyway, they, they bought me this, uh, this package to go to a Buddhist monastery. And uh, that's where I got introduced to like real high level, uh, you know, meditation. And of course, within a day, I was in an argument with the lead monk guy and we had to go and have a meeting, just me and him. But uh, that's sort of been my, a pattern for me is I guess I don't really particularly like authority. But it was amazing, you know, to, to finally turn the corner uh, because I, I, I just thought meditation was to sit somewhere and empty your mind. And that really wasn't what it was about. And this was a Zen in Mount Shasta, California. It was actually about working with your mind, right? Mm-hmm. To meditate. And then I read a, a biblical thing where it said, you know, when you meditate, meditate on these things. So now I do walking meditation. So I just, there's a, I don't know if you've ever seen the Friendship Garden downtown in Phoenix. It's a Japanese walking meditation garden right in the middle of the city. And there's these beautiful koi ponds and paths and bonsai plants everywhere. And you can just, of course, you have to pay. uh, And then, but then you can go in there and just walk. And it's just amazing. But I do the canals, you know. Yeah. Because I'm trying to over, I'm not trying to overcome so much physical pain as I am mental uh, pain. (laughs) Yeah. Do you notice a difference if you miss, do you ever miss a couple days or do you? Oh, I'm completely out of practice. Yeah. You, yeah. It's hard. It is a very hard part. You do have to work at it, and you have to work at it multiple times a day. Yeah. And when I first started working in the district, it was maybe, it was about 10 years in remission, post-remission, and I remember I was sitting in a meeting once, and I had a, you know, a fellow faculty member just lean over to me and say, you know what I find so fascinating about you, Jennifer, is you look like you know the secret to life. Yeah. And that was because I, I held gratitude in everything I did. Yeah. But as the years have gone on and, you know, the minutia of life and parenting and you fall out of it, you fall out of practice and, yeah. and even the gratitude, which is why I, I, I try to make sure I walk every day at least because it, it's hard to maintain. It is. Yeah. It's a daily thing yeah. I've learned, but it's so life changing, you know? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite words in my, uh, my dad's language uh, they say, uh, which means, uh, you know, I'm grateful. But, of course, always in a native language, you have to use like 20 English words to get to an indigenous language because the culture is so interwoven with the language. And American English is so young, you know, and it's made up. It's a collective, uh, you know, a melting pot of, of different words and stuff. But what it means, at least what I was taught that it, meant was that we're we use our mind we're intelligent enough to understand that we should never ask for anything because everything is already provided and that's what we're grateful for you know but in the cultural context of that language that meant you know freedom and clean water and you know what I mean? The, before European uh, violence set foot on this continent, there were no standing armies, no prisons, you know, none of that stuff. And so the language goes back to that sense of like, can you, well, you can't imagine you're from Boston, mm-hmm. you know, what that must have been like, you know, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, just a nice village on the nice sleepy little fishing <laughs> village, you know? And everything was good. And, uh, you know, so 
gratitude, I think, is a very powerful idea, you know, but I've learned you have to work with that. Often I've met a lot of, you know, I went 15 years without ever meeting another person with fibrillomellar. Oh, wow. And then I found this organization and now I, I, I know hundreds. We have a, we have a group online and uh, we, we have a really good, strong patient support group and advocacy and we share information with each other because with rare disease, you yeah. know, doctors usually don't know. And, um, but I find it's, you know, there are, it's easy to become bitter and angry yeah. when you've been dealt um, yeah. a hard hand. I, I was accused once uh, when I was going through chemotherapy. I walked into the clinic one day, and one of the clinic nurses pulled me into a room and said, you know, I think you're in denial wow. of, of, you know, of what, what, what your situation really is mm -hmm. because you're far too happy when you come in here. And I thought, Wait, I was I was sort of stunned, like what? Yeah. And um, and I and immediately I went to the day before where I was I, I couldn't get out of bed. I was just paralyzed with fear, which happens often, with, you know, with the overwhelming sense of dread and yeah. having to deal and come to terms with your death at 23. My my dad, who lived about an hour away, had to drive into the city and make me get up. Um, I had a good support network. They they only gave me. We had a, I had a four-hour rule. I was only allowed to feel sorry for myself for four hours, and then I had to get up a day. So I knew that I, I was definitely not in denial, but I also didn't allow myself to, to wallow and carry it with me. At the end of the four-hour window, I, I had to run. I would run really hard, so much that my lungs, like to the point where your lungs feel like you're going to explode, and then I'd walk and it always felt better. And it was like I was running to leave that dread behind me and I could get on with my day. And I said to the nurse, I was like, you know, I feel so sorry for you that, that, you're, in this, that you're in this field and you don't even know what hope looks like anymore. To me, that's, that's really unfortunate. Wow. What a turning of the tables. Right. Yeah. So r early you had a practice. In, yeah. in a way, like well, intuitively, you were like, you know, no, I'm going to smile. Um, I mean, my, my parents really worked with me on it. Yeah. Um, it's it's, it's a great to have. And I was very privileged to have such a, an amazing support in, in both my parents. Yeah. Um, but they both were, were really active and, and enlisted my roommates to make sure that I, that I was active, that I, you know, I took the time. You have to take the time to go through that Yeah. because, you know, strength doesn't come without darkness. <laughs> I mean, that's right. You, when, when, when people used to say to me, you're so strong and I just can't deal with this. And yeah. I'm like, I can't deal with it too. Many days. It's yeah. very difficult to deal with it. But the fact that I get up the next day yeah. and I carry on is what makes us strong. Right, so it's not with it's not the absence of fear, it's the ability to carry on with the fear. Yeah, and um, and I and I truly believe that the you know the whole time it was, I have to acknowledge what I'm going through, but then I also have to enjoy the time that I have left. That old saying that uh, iron sharpens iron, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and uh, early on, I had I had a life changing experience twice actually, well now three times. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, one of them was, and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm learning not to bring so much of my own personal stuff into these podcasts, but I <laughs> seem to always, in the conversation, do that. But even of, of a recently, I had uh, finally talked to the right people about holding a son in my hand who had died. And that led me to be in really, to a dark place, you know. And it's taken me years to finally have peace, and I do now. You know, because through meditation and, and, and talking about it, but you're right. It's like, whether it's death, I mean, this wasn't my death. It was sort of my death, you know, but being confronted with the ultimate, it makes, it makes you pause. And it is amazing how like your sheer intelligence and your family support and your will turn that all into something beautiful. I know that when I first met you, you showed me a video of how you found the love of your life oh, yeah. during all of this. Tell us about that. I do, yeah. Well, I was too old. At 23, you're too old for Make-A-Wish. Make-A-Wish ends at 18. Uh, so my doctors, after my second round of chemo, uh, my tumors hadn't shrunk. So that was not, that wasn't good. 
So my doctors had maybe suggested I consider to getting taking some time with my family. Um, of course, I had visions of Europe. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I want to go back to Spain. I had done a semester abroad there in college, and but I wasn't allowed to leave the country because I had to. I still had wherever I went, I had to go to a clinic twice to get my, to get my labs and blood work done. So I thought, uh, you know, I grew up in Boston. I've never been to the Rockies. I think uh, what was that movie? City Slickers. City Slickers had come out like two years before. That's a great movie. <laughs> and I said, well, I've never been to the Rockies. I'd love to see the Rockies. And um, I've never been a, a religious person. I'm, I'm a nature person. Yeah. <laughs> nature is where I find my peace. And, and faith is, yeah. is, is when I'm out in nature. And so to me, I thought going to the mountains would be a really great place for me to get some time to basically come to terms with my death and yeah. Spend some time with my family. So my mom did an enormous amount of research and called places because I had to be able to go into the hospital. It was great. So we, we went to a, a dude ranch in Colorado. It's in northwest Colorado. Latigo Ranch is, is amazing. We've been back several times. We've taken our kids there. It, it's high in the Rockies, 8,000 feet um, up and, and sits on national forest land. And so you would ride five hours a day and have really amazing food and just be out with nature. Well, the very first day we were there, my mom fell off her horse and got a concussion. <laughs> and she's, she's stubborn. I mean, maybe I get that there, but <laughs> she's stubborn. And so she insisted on riding every day. And the rest of us would go for five-hour rides, and she would go for a 20-minute ride. So some poor wrangler got stuck with her on the 20-minute rides <laughs> every day. And... Um, I would come home in the afternoon. She'd be like, you should talk to this boy. He's just so nice. And I thought, like, by Wednesday, I had said something. I think I said, you know, Mom, good God, I am here to make peace with my death, and you're trying to set me up with somebody. And he, he asked, my cousin had gone with us, and he asked her if we could go out. And I was like, no, I'm in a very, like, you know, I'm here in, in a different headspace. And, yeah, so that was that. And we moved, and we left. And, and then after the surgery... So accidentally, during surgery, they accidentally um, nicked my vagin nerve. So your vagin nerves aids in digestion. So I was about two years, no eating food, and I got my nutrition every night by hooking up to IV bags. Um, but, you know, it took a month or two of being really s exceptionally sick. And so I was eventually malnourished. I got re rehospitalized, and, and then I got started on what we call TPN, total protein no nutrition. And once I had the TPN, I started feeling better, and I just, I just wanted to get out of Boston. Everywhere I went, I just kept thinking about, you know, being sick, and I just, I feel like I, I needed a fresh break, and, and I, so I, and I loved ASU, so I thought maybe I'll go back to Phoenix, and I called the, the ranch. I had gotten along really well with one of the owners, and I was like, you know, by any chance, and he's like, yeah, absolutely, come on out. We'll take you. We'll find you something to do. I thought it'd be a great way to, to heal, and you know, some physical, physical work would be great. And, um, yeah, I went out there and he was, he came back again for a second summer. He was the wrangler who took my mom out on her 20 minute rides that she was trying to set me up with. And, um, as soon as I, as soon as I saw him, it was like, I was home. It was, yeah. So, and we've been married 21 years now. Yeah. That's Our awesome. Lives. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a gift. Yeah. It was a gift out of a, a really dark situation. So, you know, I'm really lucky in that way. Did you all stay out west, or did you head back east? Or? No, we we did. We took some time and drove around, but then we moved to Phoenix, and then yeah. and then we moved back to Ohio for a while. Yeah, we were a little transient until we came here. So, what a great, what yeah. a great story! Yeah, uh, you guys, hope, hope, and hope. <laughs> um, so yeah, we uh, we're here at the New Media Lab talking about uh resilience you know and uh, getting to know our director of the, the ctl dr jennifer strickland and we had talked about having a podcast because we wanted to talk about hope and we wanted to talk about this uh this story this personal story jennifer is courted to uh, be a speaker i know she's being a little <laughs> humble over there but you tell your story and a two-time cancer survivor uh, has an amazing life story of at 23 years of age was pretty much uh, handed a uh, end of life uh, diagnosis and she decided that wasn't going to work for her and uh, 
how many years later? I can't. Uh, how yeah, many years later are we here? Twenty five. Twenty five yeah. years later, and we're still just getting started. There's that Dale Carnegie philosophy. Yeah. The most amazing things happen when there appears to be no hope at all. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been. Uh, I just finished a book uh, called "The Universe Has Your Back," and uh, this woman is ten years in recovery. Off camera, we were talking a little bit about that. Like, you know, sometimes the way higher ed works is I've always compared it to a piece of cake. You know, there are those of us that are fighting over crumbs and there are those those who are having a piece of cake. It causes a lot of, uh, I just think we, if we could figure out how to, to write that, I think we'd be a much healthier institution, you know, where we could support everybody within a context I understand budgets and limitations and all of that, but we do need it. I would, in, you know, I want to see some more support for people that have ideas. I think that's what the university does really, really well. Um, not that they don't have problems, but in this chapter, talking about letting go of the wheel, you know, it's always a reminder to let go of the thing, you know, negativity things and just stay open to alternatives. And in your case, life. I mean, you let go of this diagnosis of your doctor gave you three to six months and you said, no, I'm going to think I'm going to let go of that. And <laughs> you took the power to create your own well-being and life with the assistance of amazing doctors and family support. What a, what a great story to hear. And I hope, uh, I hope we give a little bit of hope to people that are going through some struggles out there, you know, that the there are uh, brighter days ahead. And one of the things the CTL used to do when I got here was they used to get the third floor group down to scoop ice cream for all of us uh, worker bees. <laughs> when are we going to get back to scooping ice cream in the CTL, Dr. Strickland? It has been a few years. Yeah. Been a few presidents. <laughs> <laughs> Don't first, get me started. <laughs> first, we have to come back to campus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe if we start uh, serving Brussels sprouts instead of cake, nobody will be fighting over crumbs, <laughs> and we can have more equal distribution. Yeah, that would be nice. Right? <laughs> I think just think it would be really great. You know, I mean, one of the things when we hired our last guy, that was we all committed. Like, I committed to, you know, like, I, I don't care what your vision is, really. I just want you to be successful. If you're our president, I want you to be successful. So whatever we need to do to help you be successful, let's do that. And so he put a model up that was real comfortable from the job that he had retired from as a president and said, you know, let's do this. And we did that. And then we split on a Wednesday, you know? Yeah. And so we, as a result of that and COVID, we don't get to scoop ice cream, you know? And I want to get back to scooping ice cream, you know? <laughs> I, there's so... That's the frustrating part, you know, is that there's so many smart and talented people that work here. You know what I mean? And people that have stories. I don't know if, like, your story, your story is absolutely amazing, but there are so many people here who have lived through hardship and came out better people, wiser people, more compassionate people. I, I just want us to realize our potential. And it's sort of like parallels some of the things we've been talking about, like not taking for granted the amazing institution that we have here at Mesa, our location, our demographic, our funding. You know, we need people who have that will to see into the future and create it like you, you did for your own personal life, you know? Hey, have you been reading any books over the COVID break? Um, yeah, I did. I, I wouldn't, over the holiday break, I did. I, I read, uh, I tend to read historical fiction, so I'm really bad at names. Uh, one was a, called Tea Leaves, and I don't remember. Yeah. I'll have to look in my, yeah. in my, uh, my Kindle look, my look. I read through books, unfortunately. Yeah. I tend to read books super fast. Yeah, yeah. I get addicted to them and I can't put them down. I know. And then I forget them, unfortunately, which is why I try to take <laughs> notes. <laughs> well, I know, um, uh, I know since I've uh, got to know you a bit, for our listeners, Jennifer has a, a really uh, beautiful office in the CTL. And in the middle of it, she has uh, a big bowl of chocolate. 
So in between my teaching duties and everything, I used to walk over and crash the CTL all the time, and I'd just walk in unannounced and grab me a piece of chocolate. Not doing that anymore because I'm down 13 pounds, but every time I would come over there, uh, you were always reading periodicals and journals and keeping up on literature. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a learner. I'm a, I just... Every, I see every opportunity in life as a learning opportunity. I'm sure it drives my doctors crazy because I'm constantly, oh, that's so interesting. Tell me more. But wait. And uh, so I, I ask a lot of questions, not, not to be annoying, but just because I want to learn more. Right. And I, I just feel like all, everything in life, every, everything is almost an opportunity to learn something new. Yeah. Do you seek out doctors who uh, have an open mind for that kind of like, it you sounds know, like you integrate a little bit of holistic with the... It's really hard to do these days. Uh, I don't know if it's unique to Phoenix. I've been here 20 years now. But, you know, you don't get to pick your doctors anymore. You pick institutions. And you oh, don't... Wow. Uh, you can't... It's fascinating. Um, I've been trying to leave my oncologist, and I'm not allowed to uh -huh. unless I get his permission. And so, uh, you know, healthcare these days is not what it used to be. I mean, that's not to say there isn't amazing strides in medicine and right. science. There have been, but there's also a bit of a of a loss when it comes to being able to manage your, your individual care and who you see. Well, you're a prime example, too, of that you are your best advocate for your own health. And you know? It's so important and so hard. They yeah. make it very hard to be your own advocate. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to be an advocate now, and I'm six weeks in and have gotten nowhere. So. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's challenging the way, yeah, it's challenging, but it's super important. It's, it's really the only way you can, because honestly, nobody's going to care as much about your health as you do. That's right. And, yeah. and if you have to see a specialist, I can assure you they don't know the whole story. So it's kind of like what you said, everybody's got a story. And yeah. when you go to a new doctor, they don't know it all. Right. And so you have to be your own advocate. And it's a tough role to be in when you're sick. Well, I think some of that is is people have be I, there's so many layers to get get to that, but um, because doctors have become so specialized in anatomy, you know, they see one system, right? Vascular disease, or yes. heart disease, or right, and so the idea of putting the whole body together and to find physicians who are you know open to that because. They have a lot of pressures too, right? And they and and I think they all want to get somebody well, and but you know they're only going to look at the lower descending artery and make that thing healthy. They could care less about your kidneys, right? That's right. And so, I mean, I because of actually, you know, my conversation with you of what I went through recently with a, a little bump in the road medically, I actually got rid of my doctor because he was re completely resistant to holistic medicine and he did not want to hear one thing from me about my own health he just wanted to do it his way and prescribe you know something and I say I can't do this and and why talk with you about it and I ended up interviewing I interviewed doctors that's great and I said listen I want to be an advocate for my own health you know I want to I, I want to I'm healthy and I want to stay healthy and I want to you know, live and and I found this guy, man, downtown, and he he and his staff are the most amazing people ever. Because one of my best friends is a holistic MD doctor, but sometimes you know, roots don't cut it. You know, right. I need something a little a little <laughs> deeper. You know, and now they work together. They talk. Uh, they share notes. You know, because I'm amazing. Like, they're both invested in me being healthy. And I want to be healthy. So, you know, that culture of these arrogant physicians who just, you know, have, we got to find and support the, the doctors who have a more holistic approach, you know? Yeah. Because it is our health, you know? It seems reasonable to me that if you were a physician, I know uh, you would want your patient to be invested in being well, I would think. I don't know. Right. You know, I don't know why someone would be upset about that. Well, I mean, and, and even if you think about, you know, Maricopa as a, as an employer, it would be beneficial for us to have healthy employees. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, to support wellness is. Well, I, I told our president when we come back to work, I'm definitely, if I, 
I'm going to try to schedule the Mesa mile into my calendar. I'm going to bring tennis <laughs> shoes. That's great. Because I never could understand that because, you know, we get over here and we get so deep into our projects and working that I, you know, like, like I don't have time to go walk a mile and then I got to, you know, change my shoes. And, and, and that's one of the things this meditation has brought about to me. It's like, eh, you, it's eh. important to do it. You do better work when you do it. Isn't that amazing? It is. Yeah. And I'm still in recovery from a dissertation and it took me, <laughs> it took me six months to stop counting the chairs in the room, you know, because I did quantitative stuff and, you know, analysis and, you know, just like get back to a normal person. <laughs> hey, what is your, tell me about your doctorate experience. I went to, Ohio, I went to Ohio State and they had, it's a, it was unique. It was, it's in their cultural studies. Well, at the time it was. So this was in 98 and it was in their cultural studies program. It was educational technology. So it was a focus on educational technology through the lens of cultural studies. So uh -huh. how culture impacts technology in, in the classroom. Wow, really? Yeah, it was really fascinating. It's a lot of Foucault and Derrida. And it, it took me a good year to learn the, the speak of, of that. But it was really fascinating. And, you know, gave, we, we had, I, I really enjoyed the program. And... It, it forever changes your perspective when you take cultural lenses on, sure. on the world, right? Yeah. And you realize how skewed things are. And even in education and in technology, people think technology is neutral. So not neutral. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. In, in what ways? What do you mean? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously it was 98, right? So it's a long time ago. But at the time... Uh, Oregon Trail was one of the most popular educational softwares used in schools. So at the time, it was mostly software. It wasn't the internet yet. And uh, I mean, Oregon Trail is... I've never heard of it. Oh, it's um, <laughs> it was a software program about the expansion of the West, right? Of Western expansion. I mean, it... What's that? Dysentery. Yeah. Yeah, you would die of dysentery. You must have played it when yeah, you were in yeah. school. <laughs> See? Oh. It was a game? It was it was a game and it was meant to be a historic game, right? Oh. To learn the history of the westward expansion. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's um, probably why I never But it's, you know, very colonial imperialistic perspective on, of course. on America. Yeah. Um, but it was by far I mean, the number one software for several years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, access there's of course the digital divide, access technology. There's there's so yeah. many facets about technology that are I think you all have done a fantastic job over there is being mindful of that sort of stuff. And I know we have here in the lab, uh, we early on, right away, we created a, a, a canvas page and a lot of instruction. And I know that Alvin uh, and his crew, you know, the assumption was if we do online or whatever, like, oh, well, everybody has a computer at home. And then it even got to, oh, everybody has internet at home. And then, and then it was like, no, that's not. Not the case. <laughs> not the case. And those guys stepped up big time. Yeah. And I know uh, Laura Ballard has, uh, she was talking about, even before COVID, about how to get Chromebooks into people's hands. Or like when you go to the library, instead of checking out a book, you check out a Chromebook, mm -hmm. you know, that's fully loaded. And they're low cost, you know. And. But then it always comes down to, well, what if someone steals one? Like, so what? You know, I don't know. Get another one. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> They're not even $200. Yeah, I right. mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, right? And, but but the, from my perspective, the thing was uh, how mindful people were. And now my, really, my hope in all of this is that we do, because ever since I, I've been here 21 years and from day one, I heard silos, 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 silos. And over here in the lab, we, taught, we, we preach teamwork, 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 and community. And uh, I think this has given people an opportunity to let go a little bit and understand that we can all have similar things happening without duplication, but that, that there needs to be a cultural shift. And that what's most important is that students have access to the tools they need. And so if it comes from the CTL or it comes from the New Media Lab or the library or the department, or who cares? Let's just get it to them. Let's get it to them. You know, let's work together. This is what I, I really admire about 
what you've built here is that it's really the perfect combination of 21st century skills, technology, skill building, but as well as having voice, right? I mean, giving students a voice and really engaging with content in a way that's relevant to them. Right. I mean, it's an ideal model. It'd be great if we did it all the time. Yeah. Well, we were, we're building these on all 10 campuses and then COVID hit. And mm-hmm. then once again, now our, our best partner has left the building, you know, Yeah. Uh, decided to go back into the private sector, which uh, once again, you know, we, we let these talented people go, right? I mean, we had our, we had our provost on a, a month-to-month contract. Can you imagine? No, I did not know that. I mean, I think we're all on, I mean, we're all on year contracts. I mean, right. every year you used to get this contract in the mail that says, you know, what it is. And I know at presidents and them had evaluations once a year, which is reasonable for the kind of money they make. You know, you're making $270,000 a year. Yeah, I think an evaluation once a year is pretty reasonable to ask, you know, month to month. And we've, I've watched so much talent come through uh, because, you know, of those sorts of things that could have changed that easily. But nonetheless, we press on, right? Yeah. We, we press on. We keep our eye on the prize, which is the, I just think we have this amazing opportunity. And some days I get, when I hear we're down 20% and 30%, it, it's, it's alarming a little bit. Students have more choices today than they did 20 years ago. But we, we've got the best thing going, the best thing going. And because of the people that work here, from the, our staff to our student services to our faculty, if you teach at a community college, man, your heart has to be in it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I worked at the university for a long time. You know, we don't, you don't, you don't, it's not the sage on the stage. You just don't walk in and tell everybody how brilliant you are and then, leave the room you know you have to get in here with it and it gets messy you know but that to me is what makes it all worth doing being an educator yeah and i think the ctl you all have done a good job of creating space for faculty to come and grow you know we strive yeah you got a good thing going i miss coming over and stealing your chocolate and crashing over there and annoying people and walking in unannounced and yeah i look forward to that. that i know I mean, my dogs are going to be really sad when we come back to campus, but <laughs> I, I do look forward to having a community again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we always uh, give our guests the last opportunity to say something to the community about your work and the, whatever your area is, the CTL. Is there anything that you'd like our community to know before we sign off? Oh, there's so many things I could say. But, um, you know, I think given our, our conversation today and just just believe in yourself, always believe in yourself and be true to who you are and don't let other people tell you what nobody, you know, you, you get to make the decisions for your future. And so have faith in that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, Eddie Webb here at the New Media Lab at Mesa community college and we've had the privilege to talk with dr jennifer strickland who is the director of the center of teaching and learning here on campus and we're just wishing everybody a good spring semester we want uh, everyone to be healthy and and happy and one day we'll all come back to campus and uh, tell our stories in my dad's language they say don't have to go which always means we'll see you